morning, everybody. <laughs> Good to see you here today. Do you want me to just stay here? Or? You just stay there, Taylor. Oh, I'll stay right there. Okay. All right, Working yeah. this out as we go. I got good news and bad news for you, Taylor. I'm all ears. All right. So the good news is there's a guy that's really important in my life, my brother Brad. Where do I look, by the way? Do my I look at you brother, or them? Or? <laughs> my younger brother Brad, very important person in my life. Love him to death. He's a great friend even today. And over these last few years, we've been working together quite a bit and uh, just come to love you a lot. And I can tell. Sometimes you remind me of my little brother, just a lot younger brother. A lot younger? A very much younger brother. And they're messing up. I'm sure the camera people are going to be mad. So I'm not telling them. Anyway, so sometimes with my younger brother, though, I'd have to set him, well, some lines. And today we're talking about boundaries. And I used to draw them on the seat of our car, like where my brother was not allowed to cross. And since we're here today in the sanctuary, I couldn't do that. And so I brought with me these tools because there's a boundary that's been crossed lately uh, since I've been the lead pastor for the last couple of weeks. Here we go. Okay, I thought here we go. The best go. thing to okay. do is yeah. just to address this publicly. That's always the way to go, yeah. too, yeah. 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 That kind of what Jesus says. First that's you, what he says, yeah. First you I think tell so. everybody, and then you talk then to Then you the go person. to your father in prayer. Yeah, that's Maybe what he says. Something like yeah. that. Anyway, yeah. Yeah. so the, the line is this I have one rule as a lead pastor. You know what it is. Apparently, I don't. Well, <laughs> it said that we cheer for one college football team. Oh, here we go. Here we go. And it's not the University of go. Florida Gators. Here we go. In fact, I'm being generous. It's really anybody else. <laughs> anybody. Because I'm a Kentucky fan, and we yeah. really got, we, well, we lost 31 years in a row, and I'm still bitter about that. Yeah. And so I've noticed lately, especially the last couple of weeks, and I think it has to do with this change, and you're just kind of crossing some boundaries, <laughs> uh, is that there's more sh Florida shirts around here lately and uh, bumper stickers. And I've noticed something, and here's the final straw. Exceptional entrepreneurs made these cornhole boards out there in the lobby. Yes, they did. And they're huge. They're University of Florida boards. And I can't get rid of them because they were made by our exceptional entrepreneurs. I love those people. I can't get rid of them. But as soon as somebody buys them, they just make more. And uh, so anyway. It's actually me buying all of them, so they just keep making them. Oh, is that right? Yeah, See, yeah. I knew you were behind it. Yeah. And so today, I, well, we're going to talk about boundaries. And I just thought it'd be, it'd be good for me to start with this, this is what I used to do with my younger brother. You know, I was like eight, he was four, and I was like, this is your space. Don't cross it. And this is like a symbol of what's been going on with college football in our midst. And so I'm starting off with some yeah. boundaries today. I'll work Thanks, and, everybody. I'll work and stay in my box right here. You got that's, that that's box. What I that's have. your yeah. place. That's what I that's have. That's a lot of room. I'll, I'll put my gator stuff away if you let me wear eagle stuff every day. Is that yeah, fine? Yeah. Is that fine? Are we good? Oh. <laughs> yeah. So we're in a fantasy football league together, and the draft was last Sunday night. And his team is named after Jalen Hurts. Yeah. And so on the second round, yeah, tell nobody him, picks ahead. a quarterback in the second round, but I jumped up seven rounds, and I picked Jalen Hurts just to smite him. <laughs> <laughs> so now he's got to change his team name. He's got to change his team name. Where's my line for you? That's no, my no, no, line no, no. for I you. I set boundaries for you. All right. I set boundaries All right. for you. I'm going to talk about Jesus now because someone has to. Okay. Um, so... So we're in this series we started called oh, Calm. Yeah. Calm. <laughs> Healthy relationships in anxious times. Um, and we talked last week, Pastor West, believe it or not, preached last week the word of God. And he, <laughs> he, thank you. He talked about how we can find godly confidence that can help be the antidote to anxiety in our world today. Um, especially when it comes to our relationships. Because we know that anxiety and fear runs rampant today and our relationships suffer as a part of that. And so today we're going to continue in this series, continue looking at the teaching and example of Jesus to learn about the tool of boundaries, boundaries. if you couldn't have guessed it. And in its simplest form, boundaries are property lines. We're going to talk more about exactly what that means in a little bit. Um, but, but let me just lean in for a second. And I would say that boundaries are essential. They're necessary. That coming from two people who have experienced the pain of life before boundaries and a little bit of freedom from life after boundaries, let me lean in for a second and tell you that our relationships will not survive, let alone thrive, without healthy boundaries. If we do not have healthy boundaries in place, our relationships more than likely will not make it. We learned last week, Pastor West taught us that the word anxiety, it means to, it means to choke. 
And I think that's a visual for what happens to fear when it creeps into our relationships, that it chokes the life out of our relationships. And we can see that when fear takes the driver's seat, um, we begin to do things and think things that it feels like we're held captive to other people in fear of what they might do or think or say about us. And so we're going to talk today about boundaries. Now, let me just say this. We're talking about, you know, not choking the life out of relationships. Um, this is why that course, Emotional Relationships, matters. Um, so I highly encourage you, I really invite you, mm-hmm. pray about taking this course. Because you can learn some tools to, to really have relationships that honor God in pretty amazing ways. Um, so please, please pray about that and, 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 and sign up for that. But we're going to talk about boundaries. Um, and whether you've been following Jesus for years or you're even here and you're not quite sure you know, you know, what you think about faith, what you think about God. Let me just say this, that today has a lot of important principles, and it all comes straight from God. In fact, we see that boundaries were even present at the start of creation. We've learned this the last couple weeks, and it's, I don't know how I missed it this whole time in my life, especially since uh, Taylor has already admitted, we both struggle with with boundaries and codependency, and that leads to anger a lot of times and other problems. And I don't know how I missed it, but Genesis 1, (laughs) which is the first, you know, chapter of the Bible, there's boundaries in the first few verses. Look with me at uh, this account of creation, Genesis 1, 1 through 5, and look for the boundaries, the uh, separation, the, 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 the form that takes place with the work of God. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was formless, no boundaries, and it was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. And then God said, let there be light, and there was light, and God saw that the light was good, And God separated, there it is again, the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. And it continues on. We could keep reading Genesis and find example after example of how God separates one thing from another and creates boundaries. And what this is is doing is it's moving from a formless void, some translations use the word chaos, into uh, a place of order and when I think about relationships and the problem that anxiety has caused in my relationships and fear it oftentimes inserts chaos into my relationships and so we see at the very beginning that God adds stability to the world by setting boundaries for the world and what does this have to do with us well it affects our relationships but even deeper than that you and I are created in the image of God Let that sink in. You're you're not just some sinner that wandered in here. You're a saint created in the image of God. And friend, we enter into a relationship with God to be able to reclaim that identity and to discover more about it. So it just stands the reason if God is a God of order and brings order out of the chaos, then that's what God wants to do in our life. But also that's what we yearn for. There's something inside of us that that yearns for boundaries and to be able to set some limits in our life. And it's comforting to know that that our God is a God that turns chaos into order. And in fact, that account in Genesis 1, centuries ago when it was written and first read, it was so different than other creation stories that were told then from other creators and other gods. So you you can do some deep dive research on this if you want to. It's, It's fascinating. So a common creation story then, whatever God or powerful being it was told of, way back then, it would have a common theme. And it would be a creator, a powerful being, creating through violence and chaos and destruction. That was kind of the way they created. But then Genesis 1 tells about a different kind of creator that created in a different kind of way. It was through calm and ordered speaking. It wasn't making chaos, creating chaos. It was transforming chaos, bringing order to chaos. It was a different kind of creation story, which means it's a different kind of creator. And we even see God reflected in that creation story. And we can see in our lives that since we are made in the image of God, we reflect our creator. And so we reflect our creator when it comes to this healthy separation that happens. We even see this healthy separation in the very nature of God when it comes to the Trinity. This is God being three in one and one in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. These are distinct identities, 
but yet they are separated and connected at the same time. Their distinct father is distinct from the son, is distinct from the Holy Spirit, yet they are connected as one, as God. And this in turn means that we can reflect this same kind of, as Peter Steinke, a pastor and author calls it, diversity in unity. We are united, yet different. In our relationships, we can be separated, separate, but connected. This is the beauty of boundaries and what boundaries do. Um, boundaries exist because, well, we see them throughout the very nature of God and in the creation itself. And maintaining our own boundaries healthily is key to having healthy relationships. Yeah, and this is going to get a little dicier as we go because uh, this preaches well, but it lives hard. Uh, this is like a great theory about, oh, yeah, okay, good, uh, boundaries. But uh, life is a contact sport. Have you noticed that? And we're always bumping into one another. Uh, my dad used to say that we're like porcupines trapped together in a snowstorm. We need each other to survive, but we sure are prickly. And uh, that's true with relationships, right? And so anytime we're talking about relationships, it can get messy, which is why I'm grateful for the life of Jesus because uh, his life was as difficult as ours is. Uh, and he had relational problems. We're going to take a look at um, relationships that he had with his disciples, but also the crowds. But then we're even going to look at his family relationships today. And here's, here's a shocker. Jesus didn't live to please everybody. What? See, I'm a grateful Christian in recovery from others' esteem. That's what my counselor said my problem was. She's like, you have others' esteem. I'm like, oh, no, what's that? <laughs> Sounds terrible. And it is. And it's meaning that I had to make everybody else around me happy so that I could feel like I was a person of worth. And that's not how Jesus lived at all. In fact, Jesus has limits as a human being. Remember, he's 100% God and 100% human. So he has limits just like we do, which means you've got to have boundaries because you can't be everywhere at once and please everybody. And on top of all that, uh, he was a non-anxious, unhurried uh, presence with people that he was with. And he modeled boundaries for us. Now, we've heard a couple of definitions. You know, boundaries are property lines. But another way to think about boundaries is this. Healthy boundaries mean remaining connected to others while also remaining connected to God and myself. See, a lot of times I would sacrifice myself in that. So read this with me, everybody. Healthy boundaries mean remaining connected to others while also remaining connected to God and myself. I, I love that definition because it, it serves for me as kind of a checkup. Like I can look at this definition and go, am I, are my relationships remaining connected to others? Am I, am I remaining connected to other people? Well, also remaining connected to God and myself in the process. And to go back to your property line visual, which I love, that really is what boundaries are. Because when you think about property lines, these are physical lines that you can't see that determine where your property ends and where someone else's property begins. And a couple years ago, when, when my family and I moved into our new construction home, we had to figure out real quick where the property lines were. Because the last thing I wanted to do was be that guy in the neighborhood and, like, accidentally cut down my neighbor's mango tree or, like, put our fence six feet too far in his yard and, like, wow, we had more space than I thought we did. Hey, what a lot. Yeah. As I'm, as I'm invading his yard. So property lines really are this great visual for what boundaries are. There are these sometimes unseen lines that determine where you end and where somebody else begins. It's a great principle when we think about what boundaries really are. Um, and, and so Jesus, he even taught about boundaries. And he taught about it in lots of different parts of scripture. And we're going to look at a second in some ways that he modeled it. But I want to look at actually one place where Jesus touches on this idea of boundaries. And it's actually in a more common part of scripture that you probably know and probably have heard of. See, in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus is teaching his disciples about a way to pray and, and gives them a prayer that they can pray. And we call this prayer today the Lord's Prayer. It's the song we sang earlier, actually. And, and in this prayer, Jesus talks a little bit about boundaries. And we're going to look at the scripture and then we're going to talk about what some of the words mean in there. So here it is, verses 12 through 14. Jesus says, and forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who sin against us. And don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. If you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. So Jesus talks about two places of forgiveness. Uh, forgiving us our sins and forgiving others who've sinned against us. Uh, another word that you, if you know this prayer that you might have seen there or know there is the word trespass. 
And I think that's a beautiful visual, isn't it? That we need to forgive places where we've trespassed or walked over someone else's property line. And that we need to forgive others who have trespassed and walked over our property line. It's this beautiful visual. And that word, actually, sin, there in the original Greek, it, it means a lapse in deviation, truth, or uprightness. A, a lapse, a break, a step over the line, if you will. And, and Jesus gives us this beautiful visual of how we need to not just seek forgiveness for ourselves, but we need to extend forgiveness to others. And then did you catch how that ends? That, that this is what forgiveness looks like, and then we are blessed by forgiveness from our Heavenly Father. It's this beautiful visual of what, of what this kind of boundary setting and seeking forgiveness can look like. But Jesus didn't just teach this well. He actually lived this pretty well, too. Jesus models for us what boundaries look like in a couple different ways. Yeah, in our study together, we've been putting this together and have been amazed at the life of Jesus, how it so closely aligns with his teaching. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Now notice what happens when Jesus feels the pressure that many of us face in life. And that comes from other people's expectations of us. Are you with me? You ever struggle with this before? Uh, well, look what Jesus has to deal with. We're going to look at Mark's gospel. And right before this, he's been healing people. And the news spreads. And so the night before this uh, passage takes place... Uh, Mark records for us that the whole town is waiting outside of a house. It was Peter and Andrew's house. The whole town is waiting for Jesus. And finally, it gets dark, and then this takes place. Before daybreak the next morning, Jesus got up, and he went out to an isolated place to pray. I don't know if he snuck out through a window and then crawled through the bushes, but he made it. And later, Simon and the others went out to find him. And when they found him, they said, everybody is looking for you. But Jesus replied, we must go on to other towns as well, and I will preach to them too. That is why I came. This is remarkable. If there's ever a trigger in my life, it is when somebody says, oh, somebody's looking for you. And I'm like, oh my, what, what, where am I supposed to be? Because people need me everywhere, right? I mean, where do I have to go? It fulfills some sick need in me to be needed sometimes. And Jesus does not have that at, at one iota. Because he has withdrawn to be with his heavenly father. And that's where he discovers his boundaries. Not through the crowd. Not through some survey. He finds his boundaries in his time with God. And so get what happens. This literally took place. Jesus left those people standing outside the house. And he went on to another town and he preached there. Why? Because he knew what his mission was. And that helped him know where he started and when he ended and what he should do and what he should also not do. And so Jesus is clear on this. And what this comes with is he probably disappointed some people, like maybe a lot of people. But he knows something that they don't know in the moment. You see, everybody that Jesus healed physically ended up dying, even Lazarus who he raised from the dead. And so there's a deeper sickness that's going on that Jesus has been sent to address, and that is a sin sickness, a spiritual sickness, a poison that's entered into our soul, and Jesus has come to rescue us from that ailment, that sickness. Does that make sense? And so he's about his father's business, and that helps him know what his boundaries are. And so this teaches me something that I did not model very well, Taylor, at the start of this message. And that is this take home. The most important boundaries I set are my own. Oh, would you say that with me? The most important boundaries that I set are my own. Now tell your neighbor, the most important boundaries you set are your own. On the back, say go. So Jesus, uh, you know, he taught and practiced healthy boundaries. And, and what, I, what I love from what we just read is, is I want us to think about this. That the people that were wanting something from Jesus, they were all wanting things that were good. Yeah. They were wanting healing. They were wanting teaching. Like, like they were wanting things that were good. And I don't know about you, but for me sometimes when I'm really struggling with boundaries, the filter for me is I say yes to every good thing. That if it's good, I'll say yes to it. And if it helps someone, I'll say yes to it. 
But what Jesus models here for us is that not every good thing is the right thing. And not no, every no, good thing. No, no, I'm going to let that settle. Say, say, say that one again. <laughs> hey, I, need, I need to hear it. Go you ahead. need to hear it one more time? Okay. Uh, not, Jesus models for us that not, not every, every good right thing, thing is the right, right thing. thing. And that it means sometimes saying no to some good things to say yes to the right thing. And for me, this is like a revolutionary deal. Mm -hmm. That Jesus did not change his boundary even though people were needing him and wanting him for good things. And I want us to look at another example now of Jesus doing this same principle. But it's in a little bit of a different context than the one before. See, then it was people wanting good things from Jesus. Let's go to a little more complex, a tougher situation that Jesus was in. And he actually finds himself in this situation in his hometown of Nazareth. So Jesus goes back and he's teaching in the synagogue. And, and he's talking about who he is and his ministry's beginning. Now, if there were anyone on the planet at that time who would have been supportive of Jesus and what he was doing and who he was, surely it would be his hometown, right? Yeah. We love a good hometown MVP, don't we? So I, some of you know, I was born and raised he, right here, Cape Coral, Florida. My parents live in the same house five minutes away from the church that I, I was born in, okay? So I like grew up here. I went to Norfolk Myers High School right down, right down the road, went to high school there. And for the past two weeks, all that anyone has talked to me about, other than making fun of me for the Florida Gators, is Deion Sanders. Coach Prime. Coach Prime. Colorado took a one-win team last year. They've already doubled their win, wins from last year. 2-0, and oh, they're ranked. Everyone's talked about this incredible turnaround that Colorado has had, thanks to Dion. Because what? Dion went right down the road to high school. Go he, Red he Knights. Goes Red Knights. He's one of us, right? It's a hometown MVP. So surely, Jesus would be seen like Coach Prime in those days, right? This little guy from Nazareth having this incredible ministry. That wasn't the case. In fact, it was the exact opposite. It says, when they heard this, when, they, when the crowd heard Jesus teach, the people in the synagogue were what? Furious. Furious. Jumping up, they mobbed him and forced him to the edge of the hill on which the town was built. They intended to, what did they intend to do? Push him over the cliff. Uh-oh. Not only were they not supportive of what Jesus was doing or who he was, they were downright furious. They were going to literally toss him over the cliff. Talk about a fear-filled, anxiety-filled moment, right? But what does Jesus do? But he passed right through and went on his way. Picture that scene for me. It's almost, it was like a movie, right? Where this crowd is kind of, you know, cornering Jesus into, into the edge of this cliff. What does he do? He doesn't let them throw him off. He walks right through beautiful but I know what you're thinking you're thinking big deal <laughs> like if there was an angry crowd and they were crowding me on the edge of the cliff I'd surely push through them right I wouldn't let them throw me off the Grand Canyon can I lean in for a moment though so physically we wouldn't let someone push us off a cliff in our relationships we let people push us off cliffs emotionally and mentally all the time Because of being held captive by people's expectations, we do things that we know harm ourselves and our minds and our well-being. Because we're fearful of what people are going to think or say about us, we order our lives in a way to please other people without thinking about God or ourselves. Because we are so consumed with what that relationship is or how the status of that one relationship is and because it has to be good for me to be good, we do things that compromise our morals and our values only to appease that person or appease that relationship. Physically, no, we're not being thrown off cliffs, but if we're being honest relationally and emotionally and mentally, and even sometimes spiritually, we get thrown off the cliff all the time because of our fear in relationships. But Jesus shows us a better way. Jesus shows us a way that whether it's for good things or whether it's things that could harm us, we can remain unchanging in the boundaries that we set for ourselves and practice healthy boundaries in the midst of all our relationships. 
Because remember what healthy boundaries are. One more time. Healthy boundaries mean remaining connected to others while also remaining connected to God and myself. All right, so let's get practical. How do we begin to do this in our life? Um, well, first, a disclaimer of what not to do. Let this be a lesson to you. I tried it myself, and it's not good. And that is that boundaries are not set when uh, I am filled with anger, a desire to control, and uh, maybe even to get even. Uh, so I tried this uh, when I was first on to boundaries. I was like, boundaries, yeah, sounds good. I'm going to put up like razor wire, you know, <laughs> boundaries. And uh, I was working with a, a mentor at the time, and I couldn't get it right. I was like, okay, I'm going to start setting some boundaries for them. They're like, no, that's not it. You're wanting to control them, aren't you? I'm like, no, but I was. And uh, boundaries are not set that way, and they're not set out of some desire for revenge or control. Boundaries honor God, and they honor yourself, and they bless others. And so to do this, we've got to remember the order of God's love. I've shared this with you before. We live for an audience of one. We live to please God. So first, Jesus tells us to love God. And then we receive God's love into our lives and love ourselves. And then out of that strength, we can love other people. So here's how we do this. Uh, Jesus was first with his father. Remember, he withdrew to a solitary place. And was alone with God so that he could do this in a place of calm and not in the middle of an argument with somebody. See, that's not a good time to set a boundary is when we're in the middle of, uh, you know, some kind of verbal combat. And here's how I would say, suggest you do this. If you visit me in my office and you're wondering about boundaries, this is the illustration that I often use. When you become a follower of Jesus, Jesus uh, makes you royalty. Uh, he, in fact, gives you a castle, an imaginary castle. And you become the king or the queen of that castle. Jesus is Lord, but you're the king or the queen. Got it? And so how do we set boundaries? Well, we first need to know where our walls are. And we kind of establish this is where I, this is where I end and this is where another person begins. These are my walls of my castle. I'm royalty, the king or queen. Jesus is Lord, but I'm under his lordship as king or queen. But the most important decision is what do you do with your drawbridge? Because in our journey of boundary setting, we've either done it, uh, we've done it wrong one of two ways. We've, we've either kept the drawbridge open all the time so that anybody at any time can just walk into our soul, take whatever they want and leave again, stick around, in fact, move in, not pay rent to stay in my brain, those kind of things. And uh, that's one extreme. The other extreme, though, is when you lock it up tight. I was like, well, you know, people are, are mean and I don't want to be around them, so I'm just never going to be with anybody. Well, that's not it either. We need one another. We're created for community. And so it's kind of the Goldilocks principle. We're looking for something that's not too hot, not too cold, but just right. And we get to control our drawbridge. So there's certain people you want to let in, and there's certain people you don't. Uh, there's certain times that you want to have your drawbridge shut up tight, and there's other times that you don't want to. Now, Speaking of drawbridges and boundaries, does that mean we can get away, oh, rid of these cones and caution tape? The answer is no. Sometimes you need cones and caution tape and a lot more in an abusive type situation. And we had a person yesterday that came that told us that they were being abused. And if that's you today, I want to encourage you to follow the example of Jesus and not let people throw you off a cliff or harm you in any way, but instead to walk away. Walk away. Where do you walk to? You can come right up here to the altar at the end of the service. One of us will be glad to help you and pray with you and set you on a new course of safety. Because one of the things I've had to learn is Jesus didn't call us to be doormats. He calls us to be disciples. And disciples make these kind of decisions out of strength, not out of weakness, not of getting walked all over. Jesus made these decisions in his life out of strength. And so sometimes he walked away. It's kind of like Kenny Rogers. Did you know Kenny Rogers? I've Googled him before. Yeah. So you got to know when to hold him, know when to fold him, know when to walk away, and you got to know when to run. Amen to that Kenny Rogers <laughs> illustration. That went over like a lead balloon. Keep talking to us. Uh, I'll keep going. Taylor, I'll take I'll, a couple I'll of these you, away. Yeah, thank you. I've earned my cones to go away now. Um, 
so the drawbridge is, is, is great. And, and it, honestly, it's one of the things that has helped me put visuals where I can imagine myself in my castle and I imagine different people in different situations. But we would also be remiss if we didn't tell you that it's hard work. Mm-hmm. It's hard work setting boundaries. And I think that's often why we sometimes settle for different mantras that we tell ourselves. Things like, well, I just, I just want to keep the peace. I don't want to ruffle any feathers. Or this is just, this is just as good as it's going to get. And can I, someone who, as someone who's in this with you, can I just tell you that God does redemptive work if you partner and cooperate with him. Mm-hmm. That in the midst of cooperating with him and setting boundaries, he will do things that are supernatural, that are redemptive, not only in your relationships, but in your own soul too. And this hard work, it starts with us. It starts with you. It doesn't mean you leave here and you go, well, I'm going to set this boundary for this person and this boundary for this one. No, no, no. It, it means starting with you. Jesus modeled that. That it starts with you. And because we are not sinless and perfect and blameless and faultless like Jesus is, chances are it means that for us it starts with some cleanup. It's what Wes just talked about. That we don't set boundaries from a place of anger, resentment. We set boundaries first from a place of peace and calm with God. So I want to take us back to the verses we read earlier. Because we want to talk about where it truly starts today for you. Here's where it starts. And forgive us our sins. As we have forgiven those who sin against us. It starts with the cleanup work in our own soul. Of the ways that we have trespassed on others and others have trespassed against us. It's easier to preach than it is to live out. I discovered that firsthand. So a little while ago, um, Elisa and I both got home from really long days. And we were having a conversation. And, and she had said something. And actually, um, in my attempt to, to set a boundary out of spite back to her, um, I said something that was kind of veiled as a joke. And she saw right through it, as she does. Um, and, and it really upset her. And I knew the second I said it, it was one of those moments where the words left my mouth and I went, no, you know, I, like I knew what I was saying. And so I could tell it upset her and so I quickly apologized and tried to move on real quick. But I could tell she was still pretty upset. And so we talked later on and she said, she said, Taylor, you, you're doing this not out of a place of trying to do what's best for our family. You're saying this out of a place of resentment and anger. And it hurt her. Because she had made that boundary with me before. If I'm not going to say things like that, I'm not going to talk like that. And so we had more intense conversation that bled over into the next morning. And so I ended up, actually it was a Saturday night, and so I came here. It was Sunday morning. I came here. And I, I just found myself praying about what to do. And that's when God nudged me and said, well, you need to truly make amends. And not just amends for this one thing, this one time that you've trespassed on Elisa. You need to make amends for all the times and all the ways that you've trespassed on Elisa. And so I opened up a notebook and I sat at my desk and I took out a pen and I cried and I I wrote a note to her. And I sought forgiveness for all of these ways, all these moments over the span of our relationship that I trespassed against her. It was the hardest note I've ever had to write. And so I got home and I handed it to her And here's what happened in the moments after. I began to hear God whisper to me, now you can be free. You can experience forgiveness. And you can forgive others now too. And in the days to follow, what would begin to happen is I'd begin to discover where my own property lines were at. Where my own boundaries needed to be. But it didn't happen until I did the hard work, the cleanup work of seeking forgiveness first and extending forgiveness after. So here are two questions I want to invite you to consider today and for the rest of this week as you talk about making boundaries for yourself. 
It's where do you need to be forgiven and whom do you need to forgive? Where have you trespassed on someone else? And where do you need to forgive where someone has trespassed against you? And I think if we can answer both those questions, bringing them to God and having him guide us, I think then we can begin to discover the boundaries that are most important, the ones that we set for ourselves. Amen. Amen. Let's stand for prayer. God, we're grateful for the example and teaching of your son, Jesus. For the ways that he showed us what life can be lived free in relationships. God, some of us, we stand here today, we watch today with our minds and hearts held captive by somebody else or another relationship. Lord, we've let expectations that others have put on us drive our lives, affect our calling, impact who we are. And Lord, I pray today that, that we would begin to take a step back in the other direction, the direction toward you. Lord, that we might repent from our own sinfulness and, and, and turn toward you and your righteousness. God, for some of us, for a lot of us, I'd imagine, it starts with those two questions. Where do we need to seek forgiveness and whom do we need to forgive? Lord, would you examine our hearts and reveal the answer to those questions with us? And Lord, would you help us to Model ourselves after Jesus who bore the ultimate example and act of forgiveness for what he did for us and our sins on the cross. God, let us follow you and your example, your son Jesus, so that we might be able to live connected with you, ourselves, and others in a healthy way. God, it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. So the atmosphere is changing now for the spirit of the Lord is in this place. And the altar will be open as we sing these words of this uh, last worship song. If you want somebody to pray with you, simply lift a hand, or you can make your seat a place of prayer. Let's worship the Lord together as our team leads us.